Hey, uh, Doug and Dick, thank you for coming in. You have simply extraordinary backgrounds and, and continue to do so. So exemplary in this whole area of purposeful leadership and business and capital and innovation and so on. And, and you're really engaging all of the CEO communities and all of this purposeful uh, work and, and especially talent development. So thank you for coming in and sharing your experiences with our audience. Thank you. Our pleasure. So I'm going to go to uh, you, Doug. Uh, Doug. I mean, you're co-founder of the uh, CEO Leadership Alliance out of Orange County. If you can give me your perspective of how you formed the alliance and what your sort of foundation is, and then I'll get uh, Dick to add additional color. <laughs> so go ahead, Doug. Well, certainly. Thank you. And I got to give my colleague, Dick, great credit. He was the one that invited me to Harvard Business School for a, a conference on purposeful leadership. And this was before people were using the term purposeful leadership. It was about the dual purpose of a corporation is to both make money for shareholders and to make a social contribution into the world of which they're working. And that social contribution, there has to be some social value they're contributing. It was with that that gave us, gave me the encouragement to really pursue with Dick uh, the need to build up in Orange County, connecting our CEOs where they could learn from each other how to build both high performing companies and a better world. That was at core to what we were trying to do. The CEOs themselves actually said, we not only want to do that, we want to work on how we collectively could work together to build out our community to solve some of the biggest problems because it's the business leaders who have the power to convene. We have a stake in this community. If it doesn't thrive, we don't thrive. We're symbiotic here we can help lead this and bring the right people to the table and help shape the future of Orange County. That's how we began. And that's what we've been doing for the last six years now. And we have doubled down on a key problem, not only in Orange County, but in America. And that is a problem of talent and a problem of capital in our region that is not adequate for the investments required and too much capital coming from outside our region that is being shipped right back out to other places and not staying here. So we have, those are the two big issues we doubled down on and we plan to continue to focus on others. But if we can solve the talent issue and help solve the employment issue, demand and supply, that can raise the whole level of our community, we believe. And our vision is a thriving Orange County for all is our vision. Well, Doug, you, you know, you're doing a, a, just an outstanding job and, and you're so impassioned and you're, you're bringing all of this engagement. And it's interesting, Dick, uh, you know, uh, Doug gave the sort of background where you introduced them to that's Higher Ambition Leadership uh, Program. Maybe you can get a little bit of context of what that program is. And I know you're a part of, as with Doug, the Chief Executives of Common Purpose and what that means and, and how that then shaped your uh, co-founding of the CEO Leadership Alliance with Doug. And you also have a background as a serial a Fortune CEO, uh, uh, Chief Executive or in its uh, chief role of some sort. Yeah, so... Uh... It really started there when I was CEO of this public company, Fortune 500 company in Chicago. And we kind of discovered by accident the power of purpose. And we were I was trying to connect the social good stuff we were working on with our foundation, with the, the strategy of the company and purpose seemed to be the way to do it. And it took off and became a, a um a force for not only, you know, being able to attract the best talent and keep it and motivate it, but it also became a way in which the company actually did even better in the marketplace as our customers uh, jumped on board. So it was one of these win-win-wins 
And from that, uh, that was about the time that Harvard uh, professors and some others uh, were thinking about this whole concept of leading in a different way. Uh, they, they called it multidimensional thinking, but not just about profit, but about, you know, how do you make the world a better place and, and how do you align those two and get them working uh, uh, in the same direction. And that's, uh, that's why I got involved with that organization. And that was the foundation. And from that, it um, one of the things I realized is as as companies were learning from each other, CEOs were learning from each other as to what works and what doesn't work, um, that there was a natural interest to CEOs to work together. And there was a couple of ways you could do it by sector or you could do it geographically or you could do it by cause. Right. And uh, what we what I concluded from that was that <laughs> a geographic focus was very powerful. So when I retired and came back here, uh, Doug and I decided that we would form this group, as he mentioned. And it turned out that one of the big first questions you had to answer for these CEOs um, was, well, why should I focus so much time in my backyard when I'm an international company and I'm all over the place and my employees will say, well, you know, hey, come on, what about us? And so the concept we had to, to initially sell uh, them and has now proven to be which gets us to this what we're working on today was the concept that you do it in your backyard encourage other CEOs to do it in their backyard and pretty soon you've got all the backyards covered but you're now going deep instead of an inch an inch deep and you know a mile wide and you can and you can get more done that way and then the concept I think that is building even in, within the federal government and, 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 and it certainly was already there in states, but the cookie cutter solutions that we tend to get out of Washington don't work so well, but what people are realizing is you gotta modify them for the local conditions. And so if you get a community collectively working on solutions and coming at it from the framework of business principles and concepts where it's fact-based, you actually can get a lot done and it'd be more tailored to your issues and 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 curated for the the the, um, the challenges that you've got on a local basis. And so that concept is starting to take on. You've seen it in the job, big jobs, uh, the good jobs challenge and others coming out of Washington where they're recognizing two things. One, the power of business led involvement in both so in social and economic problems. And number two, the power of getting communities together um, to work on them and community-based solutions. So local solutions with business leadership. And so those are the concepts that we're proved in out on a local basis. And what is happening is it's happening now in many, many cities around the country. And so we didn't know we were going to be as you know accurate as we said, well, wait, you do it and others will follow. Well, not that they're following us, but it's happening around the country and there is a rapid understanding that this is a very powerful concept uh, and that maybe we can get things done in a world where it's very divided and uh, not much is happening. You know, that's, uh, again, fascinating. You know, you're, you're bringing all of this sort of background to this uh, collective issue and collective opportunity as well, working together in the confluence of chief executives and, and uh, leaders to do good in some way to the benefit, benefit of humanity in essence and earth ecosystems. Uh, Doug, in my sense is that California is, is a unique environment and yet it's really a microcosm of the entire US. Can you discuss how it's really representative of all of the different sort of domains that are existing in the US and really provides a, a, a very uh, interesting laboratory for all the things that you're doing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, we, we tend to think of, of California as having so many other opportunities in other parts of the country, and that's partly true. But Orange County, for instance, is a population of 3.25 million, 47% is Hispanic. We have the problem in our region, just like in every other region in the country that you have in our area at $60,000 a year, 75% of the job growth is in that arena or less. And 
you cannot live in Orange County where the value of a home is very high to, for home ownership if you're making anywhere close to 60000 a year. A family here has to meet a certain median income level, just like anywhere else in the country, and the wages are not supporting that. So we realize that for us in Orange County, we've got on a demand side, jobs growing here, but on the talent side, we've got to expand that talent base to be able to meet our future requirements on the demand side. We wanna grow the demand side, but we've gotta grow this talent side as well. And that's a problem in every part of the country. So in order to grow that talent side, you've got to expand it. And that expanding it means expanding into our Hispanic community, expanding into our Asian community, particularly Vietnamese. Every region has their own type of population. Some are more African-American like St. Louis. They have to expand into that population to meet their talent requirements. That's a challenge in America today to expand our talent pool to meet the jobs of the future. And if we don't, the people that are going to be left behind are the ones that are already the most vulnerable because the jobs coming in automation in the, in the future is going to leave millions of people vulnerable. They're estimating that 16, 17 million people in America will be displaced with automation in the future. If we don't start educating those people and giving them an opportunity to a higher skilled job, we're going to have problems as a society and we're going to have problems in business. So we're a microcosm of what is happening in America in our own way. Everybody has their unique challenges for job growth and their unique clusters. But what's happening here is what's happening across America. I'm reflecting on your on your comments that you're a, a microcosm and, and what's happening there is really in some way can be personalized or localized in their microcosms, but really you're very representative. You're also representative from an environmental standpoint, from a climate standpoint, from an ocean standpoint, yeah. uh, land stewardship. I mean, all of the pieces are in your region. And I, I'm going to do a follow up, Doug. You know, what are some of the partners and, and maybe some of the more well known partners that have come on board and said, you know what, we want to work with you? And it could be from government or it could be from the educational community, it could be from tech companies, et cetera, who have said, we're on board, we've got our hands up. And then I'll do a follow up uh, question with you, Dick, later on the capital side. And yeah, you're, yeah. Uh, doing some important work there. So, Doug, who, who are some of the partners? Yeah, so let me talk about there's two kinds of partners. There's technology partners, which I'll go into in a minute, but there's also regional partners. So what we learned is that our problem is an American problem in Orange County. And to help solve that American problem and help us solve it, we had to start banding together with other regions to help advocate for new policies coming out of Washington to start getting better data that we can track in our county and knowing the right questions to ask, answer. And third, how we could find programs from other regions that we could scale here. So that drew us into building a national collaborative of 25 different regions across the country that are now working together on those three issues, policy in Washington, on what does need to change, on getting better metrics that we can track. And if you don't have the right metrics, you don't even know how to shape the right policy. So we've got to see where the problems are with our metrics. What's happening to these people that graduate from college? What's happening to people that don't have college degrees and, make, and have the skills, though, to fill the job? Third, we've got to look at programs that can be funded at a national level that could scale quickly across our country to make us competitive and make this an American century for our future so that we can continue to compete on a global level. That's critical. So that's what we learned 
and and our national partners at a regional level. But on the technology piece, we had to bring in people that are doing great work in skill certification and in educating this workforce that's going to be displaced and giving them an opportunity where they don't have to go back to college for four years. That's Microsoft, for instance. They have some really good programs. Naria Santa Lucia is doing really good work there. They're partnering with us. Google, Google is doing some really important work here as well in partnering. AWS, we've got a partnership with them, Amazon Web Services, where we hope to certify 4,000 Amazon cloud engineers in the next five years in Orange County itself. And they plan to scale that program nationally. And the key is because we're business led, we have employers waiting at the end to hire these people. If you don't have that, the degree is not the end goal. A good job is the end goal. We've got to change our mindset on that. And that's a shift in the U.S. on our education system. They've got to partner with us to get us there. And then finally, we have a really good partnership with Intel. And they are doing some amazing work in artificial intelligence and educating high school students in that. Our Orange County won and a, a national competition, the award for the best uh, product idea uh, on using artificial intelligence to solve problems uh, in our world. So that was pretty exciting. So like, and Stephen, let me just add on a couple points from the Doug has made. So this, this is a complex problem, right? It's not one thing that needs to be done to, to solve it. So stackable certificates is a great, piece of the solution, but it's a piece, okay? You also have to get that embedded earlier and earlier so that students in junior high school don't go down the path of not getting the skill, basic skill sets they need in order to be able to continue to advance in any direction they wanna go. You also have to get, you have to create this bridge, this talent bridge, the pipeline we call it, that connects talent and students to jobs. So they get the experience. So they have some sense of early on what a job looks like and therefore gives them the incentive to pursue the education they need to have and the right kind of education to get those types of jobs. So that's an important compete component along with the mentorships and the internships that go with that, right? And then you've got to change on the business side, their whole view of how they hire and what they hire and how they go about hiring and then they're changing it to a much earlier connecting early into the education chain, building these relationships, but then hiring and training as opposed to the old model, which was two things. You gotta have a college degree for your college degree or else, and that's 85% of the jobs are in the required that, that made more 79%, than 60,000. Yeah. What is yeah. it? 79%. 79. Mm -hmm. 79 that required that college for your college degree if you're going to make a, a, a living wage for your family and then and then the second thing is you had to have um they wanted you need to change their hiring practices to say all right we will hire um we will start thinking about not only hiring and, and training our own but and therefore hiring right out of school but we will also start looking at how we hire and we're, we're going to a more skills-based hiring. So these certificate programs, which are outst can outstanding to give certain skill sets, get people engaged in a career early, and it can even do that without the four-year degree. Um, these are all avenues that are important gap closers. Mm -hmm. So you got to change corporate behavior, you got to change what's going on at schools, and then you got to create these connectors and you got to use the data and you got to find out what other barriers are in the way. And so it's a complex problem. And that's why if you come at it from a systems change point of view, the way businesses tend to think of these things, a data based um, approach, then you start under, under understanding where these barriers are and what needs to be put in place. And you have a way to bring the community together. I mean, we were the first time that 
ever all the higher eds uh, chancellors ever met together and let alone the superintendents of all the high schools and then even them to collectively together. So um, the, the voice of business is very powerful, but it's been underused and not even in, in many respects, not because it's not been a collective voice and it hasn't been a voice that people thought was not self-interested, but a voice in now that says, hey, we want to solve this problem. It's amazing who, what, how you can galvanize a community to move in a direction. Stephen, there, there's a 11.4 million unfilled positions right now in America, even after these layoffs happening in Silicon Valley. That's across America. Why is that? It's because of the things Dick was just talking about, the college degree requirements, the hiring practices, and the lack of focus in our universities and colleges and junior colleges on what business really needs and building, as Dick said, these stackable certificates that allow you to get employed and can be employed to fill those positions. And that means we have to broaden our talent base, like I said, and that starts to drive inclusion and equity in our society. So it's a double win for everybody. You know, it's interesting, you know, you're talking about the business perspective and then, you know, the other perspectives as well, but it's really a confluence of all of those perspectives. And that's when you get a win, right? Everybody, that's right. Agree, right. you know, Dick, you, you're, um, it, you know, spearheading sort of, I guess, the capital side of it. Can you talk a little bit about the basis of that, how that got spun out and what your role is and what you hope to achieve on the capital side? Sure. So when we did a study of our region, uh, McKinsey, and, and we got the universities involved, et cetera, and got a lot of data and trends, it was clear that our, uh, our community was going in the direction of so many other communities in the United States and which was the wrong direction, right? We mentioned already that that we weren't creating the jobs that created that would enable families to live here. So we got at the root cause of it and we saw what communities were being successful. The common thread there was that their economies had changed in what we would call a new age, a new age economy, which is uh, innovation based economy. And that's where the world is going, and that's where the world has been going for a while. And those regions that have adapted to that change early on, like you know Silicon Valley as an example, have been richly rewarded. So they were producing more high-paying jobs than low-paying jobs. So, so they had the reverse problem of uh, you know an embarrassment of riches to some extent, which caused other issues. But, but. It, it, it is it is we waddled ourselves after that. And one of the things that we realized that if we're going to come an innovation based um, hub, that you have to have local early stage capital because it's very difficult for capital to fly in and learn about all these little startups and fund them. And if it isn't local, it's difficult to get that ecosystem going. And so we were and we also had to keep the talent that we were producing this into jobs here. And we were exporting, we estimated about two thirds of our grads, STEM grads to other regions because we weren't training, hiring right out of college and we didn't have the jobs. And we were exporting 90% of the capital that other regions were investing in our, in our backyard. 90% um, came from outside and therefore 90% of the profits left. So we said, look, if we're gonna solve that capital, we need to solve the capital problem. Or we're not gonna become an innovation hub. We're not going to move our economy in the direction we want to go and, and change that ratio of high paying jobs to low paying jobs uh, in a meaningful way. And so that meant we needed to form a, a, uh, a way to attract capital and to invest local capital. And so our problem was, fortunately for us, there was a lot of capital in Southern California. It just wasn't comfortable investing in innovation. It was a real estate based. It was entertainment based. It was an all, you know, bit startup company, not, not uh, uh, entrepreneurial based, but not innovation. So our first job was how do we convince them that it's an important part of your portfolio and that you got to get comfortable that that you need to put some of that invested into innovation. The second equation was the where that money needs to go is in the seed and early stage portion because. When you get 
rounds already to the C and D later rounds. That doesn't matter where that capital comes from, but it's the early stage capital where local capital is really important. So we then created this fund. Uh, we did it a little differently. It is a both a fund of funds and a direct investment vehicle uh, right into VCs. And the concept was to kind of create this finding VCs, ident identifying the best VCs that were local, that were investing locally in a large percentage of their portfolio, and that were <clears throat> investing at the early stage. And fortunately for us, that type of VC has been growing and we've been investing in them. And then we've invested in some of the best startups that have come out of that relationship directly. So our investors now um, have get access to not only a de-risk portfolio of, uh, of VCs, but they get, a, they get access to direct investments for those who want them that have also been de-risked because of the research and the understanding and the previous investments that have been made by VCs and others uh, to bring the, those early startup uh, companies along. So we've, uh, we've now invested in uh, something like 65 companies that have produced uh, something and then that are right, right now employing around a little over 7,000 people. Um, and a few years ago, we weren't employing any. So uh, it's a, it, it shows how rapidly deployment of capital can make a huge difference in job creation and a huge difference in, 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 in these uh, very attractive innovation jobs, which are attractive to your graduates. And so more and more of our graduates are, instead of leaving the area, are finding jobs in these startups. And then our corporations are now starting to hire directly and train. So we're starting to change the equation uh, from, you know, exporting our talent to keeping more and more of it here. You know, that's interesting. It's always a, a piece of the puzzle, right? Purposeful leadership, purposeful business, but also purposeful capital or investments. Right. You need all three. And that's also tied in with innovation and aligned with that is talent development. So all of these pieces fit together. And I, Stephen, you know, may I, I just way. like to, I'd like to comment too, that I think there's an innovation in how this master fund was designed is that it's run by a board. It's not run by three people that came together and wanted to get rich. And this board is purposeful about its county and what we're trying to do. The corporations actually wrote checks going into this. We give Edwards Life Sciences credit, Pacific Life credit. These people really help get that going. They help uh, officers from those companies. They serve on that board. And the board then is going to give back 30% of their portion in profits into the community to reinvest into building a thriving Orange County for all. So this becomes a virtuous cycle that helps sustain us all but and grow our ecosystem and grow profits for those brave entrepreneurs who took the risk and uh, started something new in Orange County. Now, earlier, uh, Doug, you uh, talked about this National Talent uh, Collaborative, and but there was a seed to that earlier in the year, which proved uh, successful, and then this became expanded to the national right. uh, event. Can you describe that journey? What, what was the incentive to do the regional one first? What were some of the outcomes of that? You can share, because, uh, and then what happened at the national side? And then, Dick, I'll get your perspective. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So again, the, the, the motivation in many ways was we needed to learn from each other. <laughs> we had no problem being humble about that. Uh, we had a lot to learn and that started us reaching out to others to learn. McKinsey has been a tremendous partner with us. Fortunately, Gary Pincus, the chair of North America has really signaled this is a priority for McKinsey to help solve this talent gap in America. And they put a lot of resources behind this. We were able then with your help to have John Hennessy, the chair of Alphabet, be a part of our first meeting. And he gave that a very impassioned and compelling message that we've got to address this and universities have got to think differently 
about how to solve this talent gap in America. We, there were about seven different regions that came together in Laguna Beach, along with a number of CEOs locally and on a national level. From that, we ended up saying, we've got to take this further. There is a lot that needs to happen here. And if we work together, we could actually bend the curve, not just on the future of our region, but we could start to bend the curve on the future of America and its ability to compete in the world. And we realized it had to be, in our opinion, business led with government at the table, foundations at the table, CEOs at the table. If we can do that and help pull that off with actual programs that scale across America and we measure our impact and we bring the economic clout from the federal government and foundations together to make that happen, we can really make a difference in this country. So Dick, your perspective, and then if I can get your you know, viewpoints of where you want to be two to three years from now, and then some closing comments. So Dick. Sure. So um, uh, the, this concept that we're talking about, we've discovered works in Orange County. The other regions have discovered work in their backyards as well. They're all a little bit different, but there's a huge commonality, more commonality than their differences. And so it was no big surprise that although all are working on a bunch of things, talent gap um, is the biggest one that they're all co a common one. That's why we decided to start there. Um, and I will tell you, sitting on a number of corporate boards, um, if you talk to CEOs today, they'll say my number one challenge is talent. My number two challenge is talent. And my number three challenge is talent, right? So, so they are seeing it not only now, but they see the trends that this is getting a bigger and bigger problem. It's not shrinking. It's it's enlarging. So, so there is a lot of energy and passion and realization that this is important, as Doug said, not just for business to thrive, but for communities to thrive and for the country. It's uh, as one uh, commerce uh, head, uh, undersecretary said, this is uh, a national security issue, actually, the way they looked at it. But so there's a lot of, of, of interest and so we met in Chicago recently, and we're going to meet in Washington, D.C. in April, and then we're meeting in New York uh, in the fall of next year um, and and pursuing the areas that Doug mentioned earlier. Um, and I would say that that what we're discovering is that there are not only is it the, the governments are looking for this connector, they like the local, they like the they're starting to realize that business, purposeful business, local leadership is a good is a good sol potential solution that hasn't been tried before. And it, it has a better chance of working than what we've tried in the past. So that recognition is growing and the energy behind it. But there hasn't been a national collective to say, OK, how do we for those who have this national perspective, how do they weigh in here? And so what we're finding is, uh, and it's it's fairly early, but we're getting um, unlocking foundation money, we're unlocking uh, interest in uh, at the federal government level, and then at, at the state level. So, um, you it's it's early, but I would say that um, uh, the commitment is growing and is very strong, and I think funding sources are growing rapidly, and I think you can look to see this is a strong foundation. Well, we're not trying to say everything's got to be the same. We're still going on the premise that you modify whatever the best practice is. You need to tailor it and modify it to the local conditions. And you need to have own, local ownership for the results. Yeah. And uh, that's the that's the key to the success. So those are the comments I'd make there. So you also outline, you know, where you see this going. You have these meetings, uh, uh, additional meetings in place and so on. 
Can you give me a perspective of what you think the ideal situation will be in terms of execution on your vision and your goals, what that would look like? And I'll get you both perspectives and then I'll get your closing comments. Yeah. So, you know, I think what we're looking at three to five years from now is one, we've helped reshape federal policy and federal funding where they are partnering much more closely with the business community and business at a local level is helping to own the driving and implementation of those funds into their regions. And in doing that in partnership with the federal government and with the education system in their local regions, because every region has a little different signaling to their education regions. Here are the skills we need for the jobs of our future. And that partnership needs to be really clear. So I think that is going to be a shift that will occur. And we hope to drive that and see more funding coming out of the federal government because we will not get there without repurposing some of the funding and increasing some of that funding because this problem is a big problem we face in America. So I think it needs to be a bipartisan effort. Second, the area of programs that we will be able to scale over the next two years, we already have identified multiple programs with our technology partners in particular, like Microsoft, could be scaled nationally. And they need the local leadership themselves to help scale that. We can help pull that off and impact thousands of lives and change them for the future. Third, we are got to get better at our measurements. The things we're measuring, like, do you get a degree or not? That's not good enough. We need to measure, where do those people end up? Why did they end up there? How can we help drive them to a better outcome? And who is doing that to get them to a better outcome? How do we start funneling dollars there into those resources? But we need data. We need good data to track these career paths. We have a vision, really, that every kid that graduates from high school has an opportunity for a career path into a good job for their future. That should be the vision we all share for America and its future. You know, it's an interesting uh, uh, program and, and really so transformative and uh really foundational. And Dick, I'm just going to give you an additional question and then get your perspectives on what Doug was saying as well. But do you see this model in America being able to scale, being adopted by other countries that looking at what you're doing and saying, you know what, we could take a version of that or other, other regions of the world. And the reason I mention that is if you get big tech players like a Microsoft, a Google and others interested, they're going to want it to scale, right? <laughs> because it's sort of like sure. they're putting the resources and, and they're going to help, but they want to be able to adapt this uh, globally. Do you see that kind of capability? And then also your perspective on what Doug is saying. Uh, yes, we do. And in fact, uh, um, there, are certain, there are regions of the country or the world actually that are further along that we can learn from and, um, and that have... Um, built a collaboration between a social contract, if you will, between business and society that has been uh, going for a while and has shaped policy, shaped, for example, Germany after the war, you know, um, changed their education system into this, you know, this, this, uh, uh, um, you can go the trade route or you can go the, you know, the, the higher ed route. And it, it allowed Germany to create this workforce uh, of highly skilled uh, uh, technicians and craftsmen that that really uh, enabled uh, the economy to prosper in Germany. That's just, I, I'm using it as an example, but there are so many other examples you can pull from, not just that, that's going back a ways that are going on today. So we see that uh, the, the Center for High Ambition Leadership, which is now called the Alliance, um, uh, does bring in uh, leaders from outside the U.S. And it's very interesting, and particularly, of course, 
um, uh, certain countries, uh, there is a, you know, they are thinking this way. Um, and, and, and there's a more advanced thinking, I would say, from a from a government point of view uh, on how to partner. So uh, there's some things that we can learn from there. And I think they would be, uh, they are clearly uh, uh, also studying what we're doing because we're a little more entrepreneurial about this approach. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's more business led than than government led. But um, so there's a lot to be learned there to, to answer that question. I would just going back, go ahead, Dick. So I want to go back to the, some of the comments that B Doug made. Um, uh, the. It, you know, this is a change in thinking. The, and I'll start with the business side. It's first it's a change in the role of business. Why does business exist? And we're moving from it exists to make money for the shareholders to it exists instead to make the world a better place. And if you do that well, guess what? You'll make even more money for your shareholders. <laughs> okay. But that shift of focus is not a minor shift and it's not an easy shift. And there are a lot of people who doubt it like, well, this is all sounds good and you're all this woke stuff. And, but, <laughs> What we're proving is that it it works and it works for everybody. So it is one of those really uh, shifts that is truly a win, win, win for, for all constituencies. So think about this, about unlocking the power of business, business thinking um, and business resources and business, you know, including people uh, to weigh in on how do we make our communities better? And, and what you get with that is a new, fresh look, a look at these issues from um, a more non-political point of view and from a point of view of, I only want to do this if I'm going to get results. <laughs> I'm not interested in creating bureaucracy or other kind of, I'm, and if it's not getting results, you know, let's move on to something else. And so that there's that element to it that is refreshing to people that we interface with. The second element of it is the power of business to convene. So they're the job holders for most of the job, not all of them, because government hires a lot of people these days, but but most of the jobs and the good paying jobs. So so you have the power to convene uh, all kinds of uh, players in your in each community to collaborate together in ways that they've never done before and so that's very powerful by itself but then you layer in fact-based and you layer in well, let's get at root causes you layer into okay what's going to really work you layer in well let's try it let's do a lot of experiments let's do some tests to see if that works and if it does then let's figure out how to get it accelerated etc so that kind of thinking is starting to being applied to local issues. Uh, for example, I'll give you one example. We first start off by saying we have a huge hunger problem. Our, uh, uh, one out of every six kid goes to school hungry in Orange County, which is unbelievable. And that number has grown since the um, pandemic. And so we started to say, okay, we're gonna solve that thing. Well, we did like a lot of people, we said, all right, let's, let's get at what needs to be done and we bought a food truck to bring food to the kids and their families and we started so, okay how do we replicate that and we realized that now you've really got to, that's more of a thinking of well let's just keep three th throw more money at the at, at the problem as opposed to getting at the root cause so if you get at the root cause and you start solving that which was the families were not making enough money the rents were going up twice the rate of their wages each year and you do that for 10 15 20 years and guess what pretty soon food goes you know that's the first thing that goes one of the first not the first but like one of the things that goes before rent before the roof over your heads and then they're homeless and our homeless was going up so anyway you get at the root causes and you start addressing that. And we've been talking about all the, you know, how you get the jobs up and how do you get people educated and getting a broader pool. And that's going to solve your social problems faster than putting more money uh, to more food trucks to get, you know, free food uh, and free housing to the community that's out there. And so that kind of thinking 
is I think uh, attractive, um, you know, to I, both uh, both sides of the aisle and, and as a fresh approach. And so I think it's very powerful and that's the foundation which gives me a great deal of hope because the investor community has has awoken to the fact to the fact that the companies that operate this way that are operating very purposefully are actually giving shareholders higher returns and harvard's done some studies on it and others to validate but you now have funds that are all trying to do these find the companies that get this and are operating in this way and so money is flowing to those companies and investors are flowing to companies who figured this out and so it is starting to multiply you've got a lot of alignment of uh, signals uh that is means that we're at a moment in time when the the old way is broken down and not working and we need a fresh approach and it's not that business has the answers that's not the that's not what we're saying we're really saying they're the they can be an organizer but they got to bring the community together it's a community solution not a business solution but they can be part of that solution and force so that's what gives me me hope about where we are and encourages both Doug and I and all the CEOs that we work with, that we're on the right path. Everything seems to be reinforcing itself that that path is going to make a big difference if we can stay on it. Hey, last one last point here that you were he, you asked about how we could scale. And by the way, thank you, Dick. You're 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 right on the money on that. Uh, on a national level, one of the key things that I think is scaling is scaling across the world now is skills-based hiring and the opportunity to do more certificate-based hiring. You can bypass that college degree for many students. We still need lots of college degree graduates. That's critical, but we need the skills of others that don't require a college degree and we can educate them and get them in the workforce in a good paying job for their future. That can spread all across the world very quickly. You know, a very compelling messages, uh, you know, and really based on so much experience, talent, resources, and so on that you have. And I'm just going to ask for uh, a really quick closing comments of under a minute each. So I'll go to you, Dick, first, and then Doug. Uh, any closing comments? And that's the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Stephen, for the interview, because we, we need to get the message out. Um, fortunately, there are more regions forming faster than we've been able to adopt them into our group. Um, but that's the good news. So really, it's 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 what we're trying to inject here is some system thinking on a more national level as well as on a local level and how they can reinforce each other. And that's why there's this energy we're finding uh, on the regional groups to join a national collaborative, not to be dictating, but rather to say, how do we how do we all accelerate together? I, I would like to say thank you to Jamie Dimon in New York and their New York jobs work with apprenticeships. They're part of our group there. I'd like to say thank you to P33, Penny Pritzker the great work they're doing in Chicago to revitalize that city and build up the talent that has been left behind in Chicago to fill those innovation jobs. Thank you to the Greater Washington Partnership that is doing really important work in the community of Washington, D.C., where there's huge underemployment with great opportunity and being able to close that gap between those who have and those who don't in that city itself. A real passion for doing that, knowing it's good for business, it's good for government, it's good for the individual. We have to combine this all together for that triple win. Good for all of us. And if we do that, we can change the world. And it's gonna be business leaders that can help drive this. Again, thank you, uh, Doug and Dick, for coming in and sharing so much and really laying out a template and a model and a process and, and a system type thinking, which you are personalizing and localizing as well, but can scale uh, to the American audience, but really also the global audience. 
and based on so much hard work on both of your parts and then the communities that you interface with. So thank you again for coming in and sharing so much with my audience. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.